Welcome back, guys. My name is Chili, and this is lesson eight of the advanced programming tutorial series. Now, the last lesson, last two lessons actually, were uh, were tick lessons because I split one lesson up into two parts. And now we are back on to talk mode. And talk, I will. I'm going to talk a shitload because we're we're talking about collision today, and collision is serious shit. But before we get down to it, I uh, just want to have a little uh, a little real talk with you guys. Let me ask you a question. Do you like the tutorials? You, you like uh, what I'm doing here? Uh, do you want to see me continue on with this? Then uh, do me a favor here. And below the video, click that uh, like button. Helps out a lot. It's a very simple thing. And uh, I will keep bringing the knowledge bombs to you guys. Okay. Enough... Uh, Enough shilling, it's time for the knowledge. So we're gonna do collision. Um, what to say? What to say about collision? Well, first of all, that's not what I wanted. I wanted a layer and I got it. I've mentioned this before, back in when we did the platformer. But you got two, uh, basically you can split collision up into two parts. You've got your uh, detection. Yeah. That's that's too much girth. We can't ignore that girth. Let's go down to three. All right, you got your collision uh, detection, and then your collision handling or your collision correction. Uh, detection is basically determining whether two shapes overlap. If they're overlapping, you got the, the collision, and correction is what you do to uh, rectify that situation. Now, it just so happens that in detection, and especially in correction, the best shape is a circle. Circles are very good, people. It's so easy to find uh, collision between, say, a circle and a point. You just check the distance. Is that less than the radius? No collision. Wait, less than the radius, collision. Greater than the radius, no collision. You got two circles. You check the distance between their centers. Is that distance less than then the sum of their radii, then you have a collision. Very simple. Uh, and correction is also much nicer with circles for reasons that I will briefly go into when the time is appropriate. But the main thing that I want to tell you guys is that circles are good. We like circles. Now check out the engine. We got our engine here. I'm going to build it. And I'm going to run it. Now look at our ship here. What do you notice about the shape of the ship? It's kind of circular, you know? Funny how that works out. It's almost like I planned it that way. Total coincidence, by the way. So yeah, using circular collision will definitely make our lives easier. However, although the, the ship is roughly circular, we'll notice that uh, it's more of an oval shape. It's wider than it is long. And so that means if we use circular collision, we're actually going to have an, a situation where it's going to look like we haven't collided and we're going to bounce off stuff. If we bounce off, like, say, right here. And that's not too good. Luckily, we don't have to worry about that because our ship, it just so happens, again, by coincidence, that our ship here... Let me just draw the ship. This is what this is the ship. Oh, I'm so good. Look at my drawing skills. Look at that. Oh, perfect. So here's our ship. Now it just so happens that our ship has a an energy shield as ships, you know, they do. And that energy shield is perfectly circular. So now we don't have any reason why that would look dumb. Again, total coincidence. Just like in, you know, Silent Hill. You know how in Silent Hill you got all that, uh, that fog you can't see? You basically can't see about 10 feet in front of you. It's not because the PlayStation has a shitty draw distance. It's just, that's the way Silent Hill is, man. It's just the way you gotta make the game. You gotta be true to you. So, yeah. Long story short, we need to make a shield for our ship. Now let's see here. Looking at my, uh, my notes. Hmm. 
So in our ship here, uh, what we do is when we when we call uh, where's where's my functions? Stop spinning thrust update get drawable. So when we call get drawable, all we do is we pass the drawable from polyclose directly, and so it's kind of like a pass through directly from uh, polyclosed to whoever is going to be the draw target. And ship doesn't really do anything. It just just passes it on. Well, it adds its own transformations, uh, the model space, the world space transformations, but basically nothing. What we need to do now is because we want to incorporate other things into the, uh, the ship uh, other than uh, the polyclosed, we need to specify our own drawable class for ship. So what we're going to do is we're going to go to polyclosed and we're going to we're going to copy and paste them this motherfucker. 95% of programming is just copying and pasting basically. So, we put that in here. <clears throat> now we got our drawable and now we've got to um, just uh, change that up a little bit. We got to go uh, the parent is going to be ship this time. So, this will also be ship. And... Now, rasterize is not going to be like this. This is not how we're going to do it. So, what are we going to do with the ship? Well, first off, first off with this drawable, uh, we are going to, in the constructor, we're going to do this transformation bullshit. So we'll set that up in the constructor, and that'll make the uh, the get drawable function that much sexier. Parent at odd angle. So the constructor, what's D? D is nothing. We don't need that. We just call transform because we're calling it on this on the drawable object. So that's that. Now for rasterize, we got two things we got to do. First of all. We got to draw the actual model of the ship, so we call uh, get drawable parent dot model dot get drawable, and then we call d dot transform trans. We transform with the built-up transformation matrix, and then we call gfx.draw d. So this will uh, this will draw our model. Now we need to draw a good old friend, Mr. Circle. Now we need some data. We need to define. We need to define our shield. So, a shield is a circle, a circle has a radius, so we'll go float, we could do int, but, yeah, we'll do int, const unsigned int, we'll just do int, radius, shield radius, equal to, we'll say 45, I think that was a good number for our model. And we also want a constant D3D color shield color equal to D3D color underscore X RGB. Uh, we want our shield to be green because that's a good shield color. So 255, 0. You can make your shield whatever color you want. I, yeah, I'm color agnostic. Okay, so I think that's all we need for the shield. Now, <clears throat> we need to transform our shield's position uh, from its world, or from its model position uh, to its screen position. Now, we need a, the model position, the center of the shield is going to be, it's going to be centered at the center of the model, which is just zero, zero. So all we got to do is to get the shield center uh, we'll go constant vec2 she shield center is equal to vec2 and that's zero zero that's the 
the position of the shield in model space times our transformation matrix. Why don't you like it? You know you want it. Huh. I'm pretty sure trans is the thing. Oh! Why am I why am I putting this in here? Why am I doing dumb things? It's very similar though. You got to give me that. Okay, so we get our shield center by transforming uh, the origin with our transformation matrix, and now all we got to do is draw our circle. So we'll go graphics dot draw circle. And we do center X, center Y, radius, color. So we'll go, you know what? We're gonna, we're gonna add something to our framework here. We're gonna go into D3D graphics. We're gonna go draw circle. Uh, now here's the thing we can do that I didn't, I haven't done it in for any of the other functions, but I'm gonna do it here. We can add a, uh, a template function that will handle any kind of vector, not just like a f vector of floats, but any kind of vector we want. And all we do is we go uh, template type name T, and we go void draw circle, and we use our template vec2 T. Uh, center int radius d3d color c we'll, we'll, we'll make sure that that's in line and here we just do we call our normal draw circle and int uh, center dot x int center dot y radius c there we go and by doing it this way we can pass any kind of vector we want in here and it'll work it'll convert it to int and do all the good stuff and bob's your uncle so i should have done that up here for uh, put pixel actually i haven't made a vector version of put pixel in the tutorial series yet anyways i, I didn't know that some things I do in my, uh, my whatchamacallit, shield, center, my prototype that I don't do in here. Uh, radius is just going to be uh, parent.shieldradius, and color is going to be parent.shieldcolor. Okay. And that, my friends, should be that. Now we should have our shield. All we gotta do is change, uh, get drawable. Now we're not gonna pass a polyclose drawable, we're going to pass a ship drawable. So we're gonna use just drawable in here. Alright, what's the. Oh, wait, this has gotta be, uh, ship drawable, so we'll just get rid of the the specifier there. And we should be good to go. Build it. Radius dot C. What was I trying to do there? That was supposed to be a comma, and you know it. Don't tell me you didn't. You're just playing dumb. You're just fucking with me. There we go! We got a shield! Look at that shield, that's beautiful. Now we can uh, clearly see when when and where we collide. So that'll make it, uh, it'll make it good for when we want to debug our collision code. We'll know exactly, uh, we can eyeball it to make sure that things are working the way they should. And it'll make the game feel less janky when you're playing it. Which is always good. Alright. Shield has been uh, activated. Let's uh, get on with the collision after I get a drink and read my notes because I made notes today. I made lots of notes.
You're getting a professional production today, yes. Okay, um... All right. <clears throat> it's time for the whiteboard. The, the dreaded whiteboard of horrible diagramming. Let's get rid of that. Get a new layer in here. So, here's how ideal collision goes, according to me. So you've got uh, some polygon. Oh, I'm going to do this on different layers. It's going to be so good. And you've got... Uh, let's, admit, let's try to make a circle here. All right, that's not too bad. I did it. You got a circle. Now you want to check for collision between your polygon and your circle. It's going gonna, it's gonna to collide and stuff. Shit's going to happen. Shit's going to pop off. Now, how do you do that? Well... You're updating your game, you update, you update, you do your step, and then you do your, your collision check. And now you, you step, and you're now colliding with the, uh, with the object. And in your collision check, how do you check for collision between a circle and this polygon? Well, you break the polygon down into its constituent line segments, and you test to see uh, whether the circle is colliding with the... Uh, any of these line segments. So you test circle to line segment for each line segment in Polygon. Now, uh, let me just move this in a little more. Durr. Durr. I fucked it up. Undo, undo, undo. I can still, I can still salvage this. This is okay, people. All right. So you're gonna test this circle uh, to see whether it's uh, colliding with any of these lines. To do that, you're going to do a mathematical operation to get the points of intersection between the circle and this line. So you're going to test this circle against this line segment. You're going to find that there are no intersections against this one, this one, this one, this one. And then you come to this line segment. You, you find the points of intersection. You find that there are two points of intersection. And therefore, you conclude that you must be colliding with this line segment. So what do you do? Well, in the ideal situation, in what I would call an ideal uh, collision detection, let's say you're coming at the... Uh, uh, I'm going to need another layer, aren't I? Today I'm making layers. This is a good sign. Because I always forget them. And then later I'm like, fuck, why didn't I make a layer? So you've got... Um, you've got a circle. It's coming in on a trajectory like this. There. Let's go from the center. All right. And after one time step, you find that it is uh, colliding with this polygon. It's colliding with this line segment specifically. What you do is, first thing you do is you want to find... Stop that. You basically want to rewind time to the point where the circle is just touching. The point of incidence. And you can solve that. You can constrain uh, this circle's motion to this uh, line's trajectory and solve for time when there is only one point of contact. Or solve for the time when the circle is tangent. And then you rewind time to that point. And then you handle the, uh, the collision, which is to say... Let's get my... Uh, my layer is set up again. Which is to say, you modify the, uh, the velocity so that it bounces off here. And this is just simple reflection, right? So, uh, this being the plane of uh, collision here, 
this angle here is going to be the same as this angle here. And you, you reflect the velocity based on the surface that you collide with. Then, let's go back here. Because you rewinded time from here to here, you still have some extra time, and so you then play that forward, and you end up here. And that is, uh, that's your ideal collision. You detect your collision, you rewind, then you rebound, and then you play time back again. That only the amount that you rewound. And you have to do this iteratively because imagine that you have another, like another, ooh, better change my layer. Imagine you have another polygon here. So in that case, you'd have a situation like this. Oh, stop it. Wrong layer. Should name my layers, but that would take time. We don't have time. There's not enough time. So basically, you step through time. You come here. You detect your collision. You rewind. You do your rebound. You step forward. And then you have... Then you... You start off in the beginning again. You detect collision. You find you have another collision. And so you rewind. And then you... Uh, once you rewound, you rebound. And so now your velocity that was going this way is going to go this way. And then you step back that amount of time that's left. And you'd end up right here. So you had... In a single time step, you had to uh, process two different collisions and... Uh, rewind time, and then step forward and then rewind again. It's an iter iterative process. <clears throat> and that will give you very good results. However, it's kind of fucked up. I actually did, this was my first try. And what I found was, it's, it's complicated because of the way that floating point numbers work. They're not exact. So when you solve for the time to rewind, and then you rewind, you find that even though you've rewound by the proper amount of time and you should just be touching the, uh, the polygon, you're actually still colliding with it just a little bit because of rounding errors, because of uh, the limitations of floating point numbers. And because of that, then your next uh, calculations get all fucked to hell. And you could fudge it, you could do it by, like, for example, taking your rewind time that you calculate and adding a little bit more just to make, give yourself some headroom. But then that begs the question, how much more should you add? How, what should your fudge numbers be? And I did that, and it worked, but I don't like it. It's just, it's a messy situation. So that's not what we're going to do. We are not going to do the perfect, uh, the ideal situation for collision. So then what are we going to do? Something very sim much simpler. Basic premise is the same. You step in. You, you First you select your correct layer. Because you don't want to fuck up your drawing. Then you step in. You detect your collision. And once you've detected your collision, you don't rewind. You leave it the way it is. And you just... Uh, you just handle your rebound. You alter your uh, velocity and then you say, I'm done. That's it. And then the next step, you just let the thing uh, run away, like this. So what happens, you just, you, just leave it, you just leave it stuck in, balls deep into that polygon, and you just say, hey, next frame, it's gonna, it's gonna leave, so it's fine. It's fine. It's fine. And that works pretty good. You have to do little things, but uh, this works fine. It's not... <clears throat> It's not 100% accurate simulation, but for the uh, purposes of a game, it's, it's fine. So that's what we're going to do. No rewinding bullshit, no iteration. Just uh, you, you detect your collision, and you alter your velocity, and that's it. You let the next frame step take you out of the polygon. Alright... So again, detection. Oh, what are you, why? 
here we go. It's just simple, uh, well, not, not simple, but it's uh, solving for the points of intersection between a circle and a line segment. And rebound is um, basically just doing this reflection thing. Reflecting in the plane of the surface uh, off which we are rebounding. Um, now this is the reason why circles, let me just talk about this a little bit. This is the reason why circles are very sexy for uh, collision because imagine you're colliding. Let's give you an, uh, a general, uh, fuck that. I want white. Let me get my white, let me get my white on. There we go. You got two objects colliding. You've got uh, one here. And let's make a new layer. I think that's the one. And you got one here. And this object is moving in this direction. Now when it hits here, what do you think is going to happen? Let's say it's moving like this, and it hits here. You think it's going to move like hit here and just go like this? No. Not even close. What happens is it's going to hit here, and this is going to create an impulse, which is kind of like a force, integrated over time, um, on this point of the uh, of this polygon here, this rectangle, and that's going to cause the rectangle to start spinning. So the rectangle's trajectory is going to change. Its linear trajectory is going to change a little bit. It's not. It's not going to go keep going in this direction. It's going to change a little bit and it's going to start spinning. So some of the energy from the collision is going to go into the spin, and some is going to go into its uh, linear motion. And there are equations that you can do to solve that bullshit, and it's fine. I've done it before. I've posted a project on the uh, forum that calculates that. Uh, but it's, it's a pain in the ass. And the thing is, with circles, there's no spinning. Circles don't spin, funny enough, because... Well, here, the impulse is going on the edge. Now, if this had collided... Let me just uh, change this up here. If this had collided exactly on this point here, it would have just kind of gone like this and then bounced off. Why is that? Because the collision, the impulse, would have gone through the center of gravity of the, uh, the object. And because of that it's going to be just a linear collision. But because it went off the center of gravity, it's going to cause it to start spinning. Now, funny thing is, with circles, no matter where you contact that circle, it's always going to be fucking son of a bitch. Let's make another fucking thing here, man. Son of a bitch. Okay. What was I saying? With circles, no matter where you contact that motherfucker, it's always going to go through the center of gravity. Because the way a circle is, all points of contact, any point that you contact that fucker on, the, uh, the tangent plane, you take the tangent, and then you take this one that goes through the tangent, and it's always going to go through the center of gravity. And that's why circles are good for collision. No matter where you contact it, always going, the force is always going through the center of gravity, and therefore, you never have any spin, you don't have to worry about, you know, angular momentum, and conservation of that bullshit, it's very simple, you just reflect the angle of velocity, and you're done. So that's why circles are awesome. And that's why we have a shield, no wait, we have a shield because it's just the way the ship is. It's not because we don't want to calculate dumb bullshit. We're not being lazy. It's just the way the game is. Okay. Um. So, yes. What else we got here? Rebound. Ah. Okay. So here's where the good stuff comes in. So now, calculating that rebound angle, right? Calculating our velocity after collision, basically. So we got our velocity before collision. We got our velocity after collision. 
which if you draw them tail to tail, like you would, like you would, it would probably be something like, uh, like this. I don't know. Whatevs. Whatevs. Mm, yeah, maybe. I don't know. Who cares? Anyways, here's the deal with these, uh, calculating these things. We could calculate them using angles here. Could take this angle theta and and this angle, which is also theta, and do a bunch of dumb uh, trigonometric bullshit and figure out, you know, this final uh, vector, given this vector, and given this uh, surface here, this plane. It's not really a plane, it's a line segment, but we treat it like a plane. We could do that with angles and trig, but that would be incredibly dumb. I don't want you to be I don't want you to be dumb. I want you to be smart. I only want the best for you guys. So, we're going to do this the smart way. Now, in order to do it the smart way, we have to learn a little bit of new math. And this new math is called the dot product. And it's basically what makes vectors so fucking awesome. I mean, we've used vectors a bit up until this point, and we found them, uh, you know, quite a good expedient. It's been nice to be able to lump our X and our Y together in a single uh, class, and be able to add points and subtract them and shit, but... Here's where the real magic comes in. It's called the dot product. So I'm just going to write down here. Dot. Fucking. Product. Bitches. Because it's that fucking good. So you got. How do you do the dot product? Well, you got two vectors. We'll call them U. And V. And you want to calculate u times v. What is that? Well, u dot v is simply ux times vx uh, plus uy times vy. And that's it. You multiply their x's, you multiply their y's, you add up the result. The result, as you'll notice, is a scalar. This is a scalar. It's, you dot product two vectors, you get a scalar, just a simple number. Now, what does that mean? I mean, that doesn't mean anything to you. You're like, okay, so you multiply the x's and the y's, you add them together, what the fuck? I, I don't care. Well, there's another way of calculating the, uh, the dot product, and that is... Dot product is the length of u... times the length of v, times cos theta. And what is that? Well, let's say this is your uh, x and y axis. I'm going to put y down here. You got your two vectors, u. Oh, that's not a good example. You got your u, and you got your v. And the angle between them is theta. I think that's the angle u to v. It could be v to u. I don't know. Anyways, fuck it. u, v, theta. Doesn't matter. What matters is that this thing here is the same as this. And this thing here is doing a calculation that involves cosine and angles. But we can do that same calculation by simply multiplying shit together. And that is going to make our operations a lot cleaner. Now the question is, the question still stands, why would I fucking want to use this? The, 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 the product of their lengths times the cosine of the angle that's between them. How would that help me? And I'm going to give you one very good reason why that's going to help you. Let's say you've got Let's say you've got a vector 
again, u. And you've got another vector here. And we're going to call this vector v hat. Because this vector has a length of 1. It's a unit length vector. All right? So we're going to find u dot v hat. And we'll use this representation here because it's easier. Uh, so u, the length of u is just going to be, again, the length of u. We don't know it. The length of v is 1, so that just disappears, right? Because 1 times this is just this. And then we got cos theta. So it's just, if you, multi if you dot u, or any vector, with a unit length vector, you just get the length of that vector times cosine theta. What is cos theta? Well, cos theta, if you draw, I should have like, uh, I should have made a different, one second, I, uh, I take it back. I want different vectors because this won't, won't, it won't look good in a diagram is what I'm trying to say. One second. Technical difficulties. All right. So what do we want? We'll call this one V hat. And we'll call... Eh, get green on this one. We'll call this one U. Now, here's where it gets interesting. Draw a line in the direction of v-hat. Okay, now draw a line from the tip of u to this line here, such that the angle is 90 degrees. This angle is theta, right? Now, cos theta is equal to, what is it equal to? So ka adjacent over hypotenuse. So the adjacent one is going to be here. Let me just get another, another color. Right here. Here's our adjacent in this triangle that we just drew, this right angle triangle. Here's the adjacent side. The hypotenuse is just our green side. That's our, uh, our absolute u. And cos theta is equal to the ratio of that. So we can replace cos theta here with adjacent, which is this thing here, we'll just call it adjacent, A, divided by hypotenuse, which is just, again, this. And that means we can cancel these out. So u dot v is actually equal to the length of this side here. So what does that mean? Well, that means we can get the length of a vector u projected onto a, uh, a line defined by another uh, vector v, which is a, uh, what do you call it? unit length vector, vector v, v hat. We can project any vector we want onto any line we want and get the length of that vector in that direction. All right. So let's just uh, do a quick thing to prove that this works. A little test here. So let's say we've got a vector 
u and it's equal to uh, what would it be x is 4 y is negative 4 okay and we want to get its projection in the direction x hat so we do u that was weird vector u dot x hat which is equal to 4 times 1 plus negative 4 times x hat the y value is 0 so just times 0 equals 4 so the length of this vector in the x direction is 4 which is what you would expect right now one more thing this gives you a scalar right it's just a length what if you wanted to get a vector projected in another direction so let's say we've got another vector u that's wrong symbol and we've got here our unit vector v and we want to get a vector that is the projection of u into v so what we do is we get the length of the projection by doing u dot v that gives us the length that's a scalar and then we scale v by that length so u dot v times v and that will give us the projected vector which is going to be probably something like this I guess something like that and that's our vector p right here so that is dot products dot products let you project one vector onto another line and get and then if you want get another projected vector they work mostly you we're using them a lot with um, unit vectors you'll take one vector and project it with another unit vector and that will allow you to determine uh, that vector's projection in the direction and because the operation itself is only two multiplies and an add it's super fast it's way faster than if you tried to do the same bullshit using trigonometry so that's the magic of vector it's basically the, well, it's the magic of uh, vector dot product but also that's kind of the magic of just vectors in general because the dot product is one of the most powerful tools you have in your vector toolbox. Alright. So I hope I didn't fuck up that explanation too poorly. Now, how do we, uh, how do we apply this to the problem of doing our collision correction? Well, let me just uh, give you a situation here. You've got a ball. Ah. Layer 2 is the ball. Remember, layer 2 is the ball. Because I may forget. Just remind me, okay. Okay, you got a ball. It's moving towards your wall. Now, the this rectangle is aligned to our uh, our axes so it, it's perfectly square to the axes so the normal the surface normal which is the uh, the vector that points away from the surface is just going to be uh, it's a unit length the vector that points away from the surface that's called the normal it's just going to be one zero basically your x hat right And our circle is going to move, oh, it's going to look dumb, bam, into here. And what's going to happen? What do you think is going to happen? How is it going to move after it hits here? Of course, it's just going to rebound back. If it's a perfectly elastic collision, uh, and this rectangle is perfectly fixed, it can't move, this is going to bounce back with the exact same velocity they had before, except that the direction is going to be in the opposite direction. 
So basically, uh, ooh, why can't I draw? B. Probably because I picked up a wrong color. Yeah, there we go. So here we have our velocity, V, uh, is equal to, I don't know, like Vx, Vy, and the velocity after collision, which is V prime, is going to be equal to negative Vx and just Vy. So basically you just, uh, you flip the x direction. And the same kind of deal would happen if we were moving from the bottom, you would flip the y. So for collisions that happen uh, perfectly aligned to our, our uh, chosen axes of x and y, that's fine. But now, let's try something different here. Let's try... I'm going to get rid of this layer too. Fuck all your layers. Get a couple more here. Let's try uh, rebounding off of here. Now you aren't sitting so pretty, are you? Because now, if you bounce off here, you're going to go away from here. Even if, you, even if you hit the thing directly head on, I wonder, would that negate? Yeah, it would. I guess if you, if you hit this thing perfectly head on, all you'd have to do, right, is just uh, V. is equal to Vx, Vy, and then V prime would be equal to negative Vx, negative Vy. So that actually holds true for my other case. In my case here, I was being dumb. In my case here, V was actually equal to Vx and zero because we had no velocity in the y direction. And then V primed, was going to be equal to negative vx, and again, negative of zero is just zero. So you have to negate both x and y components of the uh, velocity if you bounce off the wall. But that's only in the special case that your collision is uh, completely perpendicular to the surface here. If your collision happens at some other angle of incidence, you can't use that anymore. That's no good. Now here's another situation for you. Again, we have our rectangle perfectly aligned, but we're coming at it at some angle here. And we're going to leave at another angle. Now, what do we know about these two, uh, these two velocities? And we're going to ignore that these two angles are the same because we're not thinking in terms of angles now. We want to think of it in terms of components. Now, we know that because the normal, the surface normal here is pointing in the x direction, the force is also going to act in the x direction. So because the force is only acting in the x direction, Vy should equal Vy prime. And if you look at it, you see that, yeah, these, uh, this is Vy, this is Vy prime. They look about the same. It stays going in the same direction, and the length is also about the same. So we know that For this normal, surface normal going in the x direction, y is going to be unaffected. And vx is just going to be the opposite of vx primed. So because our 
our uh, surface here is oriented completely in the x direction, it's only going to uh, invert the x part of our uh, velocity component. So I'm telling you, I'm showing you all these situations, but what's the point? Well, the point is we can solve any collision if the surface is, you know, completely aligned in the x or in the y direction. We can solve any kind of collision easily just by either inverting the x or the y. We can also solve a collision for a surface with any sort, any sort of uh, orientation if the velocity incidence is completely perpendicular. But the one thing that we cannot do yet is we can't have uh, an arbitrary angle for our surface with an arbitrary angle of incidence. We just can't do it. So here's the thing. When we are oriented in uh, an orthogonal uh, coordinates here, nicely aligned to our axes, it's very easy to just say we want to flip the, uh, the component that is uh, facing the same direction as the normal because it's going to be X or it's going to be Y. But we can't flip this component because we don't know what it is. It's not, it's not all X and it's not all Y, it's some combination. So what we do, what we do, my friends, is we find, basically, how much of this velocity vector is going in the direction of our normal. How much of this is our normal, and how much of it is perpendicular? So let's say this is our normal, and this is our velocity. So we draw our velocity. Yeah, that's not, that doesn't look like it. We draw our velocity here. We draw our normal here. Here's the line of the normal. And if we dot product n hat with v, uh, v dot n hat, we get this length here. And this is the projection. Of the uh, velocity in the direction of the normal. And we find that this is actually opposite to the direction of the normal, and that makes sense because the normal is pointing out of the surface and the velocity is approaching the surface. So of course they're going to be, it's going to be negative with respect to the normal. So this is how much of the velocity is going into the normal surface. Now all we need to do is find a way to now flip this part of this um, this vo the velocity vector here. Basically, how are we going to do that? This velocity vector is made up of two parts. The component that is going uh, towards the normal and the component that is parallel to the normal. And if we flip it, the result should be like this. Now, when we are aligned to our axis, the flipping is very simply just going to be uh, 
vx primed is equal to negative vx. But you can't do that here because it's not just a simple all x or all y. So we need a different way of just flipping one of the components while leaving the rest of it the same. And how we do that is we can rewrite vx prime is equal to negative vx as vx primed is equal to vx minus 2vx. If you subtract the double of something from a number, you're inverting it right, because vx minus vx is equal to zero, and then zero minus vx again is equal to negative vx. So you subtract something, the double of something, it's the same as inverting that. So what we do is we take this vector here in the normal direction and we double it and then we subtract that from this one. So we go this minus this and the result subtracting tip to tip is going to be this vector which is this vector so that took a while and I know I didn't explain it super good but the basic idea is very simple sort of simple first you find oh I don't want green in fact I don't want any of this you can all go eat a dick. Alright, so you got your thing that you're colliding with. You got your circle here. You got your velocity. Velocity prime. You've got your normal. And hat V v prime first thing you want to do is you want to find out how much of v is going in this direction just this uh, this length the projection of v into n so you do v dot n that gives you this length now what you want to do is you want to turn that into a vector so you multiply that by n hat, and that turns it into a vector. It's not just a length anymore, it's a vector. Now, you want to double this. So you multiply it by 2, and that will give us this vector. And then you want to subtract this value from our original v. So v minus 2 times the dot product of vn times n hat. And that will give us our final result. Let's get, let's get green for this one. Subtracting this from this will get us this, which is this, which is our uh, reflected vector in this surface. So the final equation, v minus 2, v dot n hat times n hat, v primed is equal to, there you go, that is, whew, that is our uh, reflection, our rebound calculation. Again, assuming perfectly elastic collisions, no friction, etc., etc. That's the basic. Thing there. Okay. Oh. Well, it's, I'm hitting the one hour mark right now. Exactly now. 
So might be able to get this one done in two hours. But quite frankly, I am not optimistic. So if you're really uh, keen on splitting this up, this might be the time. I'm not sure I'm going to split up for the upload. Haven't decided that yet. We'll have to see. Okay. Whew. I hope that made some sort of sense. Because that explanation took it out of me, man. I'm tired. I'm so tired. But we're going to move on. So we need to do collision. Now in the collision, the, uh, the ship is going to interact with the polyclosed object. Because that the polyclosed contains all the line segments that are going to make up our good stuff. Are things that we're going to test against for uh, collision. So, first thing is first. I don't want polyclosed. We can create a uh, a function in here, and we can call it I don't know void handle collision, and we can do something like uh, ship. And ship and do bullshit in here, but uh, I don't want to limit our collision just to between the ship and the polyclosed. I want any kind of circle to be able to use this algorithm. We might have other circles later on, uh, enemies that might not be ships or bullets or whatever. So we're going to create an interface that any kind of collidable circuit circle can uh, inherit from. So we're going to go project, add new item. And we're going to do collidable, colli collidable. Fuck, I don't know how to spell collidable. I don't even know if that's a real word. Collidable. I'm going to use the able. Collidable circle. There we go. All right. And again, just the normal stuff. Pragma once. Prag me once, shame on you. Where is... What are we going to need for this? I don't think we need any kind of things. We just need a circle. Uh, so we need col class collidable circle. Alright, what do we want? So for our public interface, we want a bunch of uh, virtual functions. Virtual. I don't know yet, I'm gonna leave it open, I'll just, I'll add shit as it's necessary. For now, we'll just make a class, Collidable Circle. And the more I think about it, the more I don't think I spelled that right. Let's uh, look up the word collidable. <laughs> this is spelling with chili. Collidable. Collidable. Yeah, I got it right the first time. Good for me. I'm spelling at a grade seven level right here. Okay, anyways. Um, we want to go to our ship. And we're going to inherit from, well, I guess we've got to include it first. Fucking, I can never type include properly. Now, whoa. Okay. Okay, Chile. Calm down now. Deep breaths. Public. I wonder if people other than expecting mothers can benefit from Lamaze classes. I wonder if anyone can, like, just go to those things. Collidable circle. I think they would probably frown upon it. Just some random dude showing up to Lamaze by himself. But that's ah, discrimination. Uh, okay, so now we also want to uh, 
include collidable circle in here and then we can specify that handle collision requires a collidable circle which will not be constant for reasons okay now so the first thing if what we know about collision is true the first step is detecting the collision so what we need to do is we need to calculate the points of intersection, right? Wrong. Totally wrong. Not the first thing you do. First thing you do is you do aligned axis bounding box tests. And you might be asking yourself, or you might be asking the screen, Chili, what the fuck are you talking about? Are you smoking your own saliva again? No. Here's the thing. Here's the thing, people. This is expensive. Trying to, de trying to determine uh, the points of collision here, or the points of intersection between a uh, circle and this line segment, that is an expensive operation, and you have to perform it for every line segment in the polygon. Now, if there were a way that you could, uh, you know, limit the amount of dumb bullshit calculations you have to do, wouldn't you take it? I know I would. So what you do is you generate an aligned axis bounding box, which is an, a, bound, it's a rectangle that just sufficiently contains the object in question and whose edges are aligned to the, uh, the axes that we have in our system. So for the circle, it's going to be like this. And then you just do your normal test uh, for overlapping. So you test, uh, okay, is this one greater than this one? Is this one less than this one? Is this one greater than this one? Is this one less than this one? If all those are true, then they're overlapping. However, this one not greater than this one, so not overlapping, and therefore we can cull this one, we can eliminate it from our list without even having to worry about uh, checking for, you know, bullshit. Checking for those uh, in points of intersection is what I was trying to say. Uh, now, just because the aligned, just because the bounding boxes overlap doesn't mean that you have a collision. You can have a situation like this where the, uh, the bounding boxes clearly overlap. However, you have no points of contact, so... After you do aligned axis, if you find that they are overlapping, you still have to do your uh, your intersection test. It just by doing the aligned axis, you can eliminate a bunch, actually most of the geometry from the more uh, the more rigorous tests that require more CPU intensive operations. Look at me using my words. Water. Ah, so good. Okay, so how we're going to swing this is like a dead cat. No, we are going to do, we're going to generate uh, a bounding box for every line segment and a bounding box for our circle. And so if we got our circle like this, a bounding box can be like this. And then for every line segment, we're just going to generate a bounding box using the corners of the line segment. The, uh, the two ends of the line segment as the corners of the bounding box. And then we check this one with this one, no overlap, so fuck them. Then we check this one with this one, no overlap, so fuck them. Right in the meow, right in the butt. Uh, we do this one, oh, what was I doing there? We do this one with this one, and we say no, fuck them. And then we do this one. And we see, okay, we got an overlap here, so now we have to do our more uh, rigorous testing. So we need aligned axis bounding box bullshit. That was a nice alliteration on that one, if I do say so myself. So, for our collidable circle, the first thing, I'm just going to call this one uh, object, because we don't, it could, it might be a ship, but it doesn't have to be a ship. Uh, we'll go to Collidable Circle here. 
First thing is gonna be uh, it's gonna be rect f get aligned axis bounding box const. And that's going to be a big old virtual. And we're going to make it pure virtual because we're not, this is not going to specify a default behavior for this function. And there you go. First things first. Now, now's the part where I would generally start consulting my, uh, my uh, prototype code here because I don't want to fuck it up. All right. So what we're going to do is we are going to loop, we're going to iterate through all of the vertices and we're going to use that iteration to uh, work through every line segment. So let's uh, let's start that off here. So we want to do a four. And auto i is equal to vertices dot begin and end is equal to vertices dot y end as long as i is less than end i plus plus now the line segment is always going to be formed between the current the current vertice and the previous one. So to begin with, we set the previous vertice to be the last one in the list. So we do uh, vec2 previous equals vertices dot back. We'll go in here, vec2 current is equal to i. We do that so we don't have to dereference i every time we access the current vertice. Because it's just a little bit of a optimization. The compiler might do that for us as well, but I don't I see no harm in doing it ourselves. We copy this temp temporarily into our own vec2. Okay. So now we need we need some aligned axis bounding boxes. So we call rect f. We don't call we create a rect f. Uh, object a a b b is equal to object dot get a a b b. Now we're going to create, in our loop, we're going to create our aligned axis bounding box for each line segment. So we do rect f line aabb is equal to, now here's where things get interesting. My IntelliSense does not want to give me uh, information on rect f's constructor just pissing me off a little bit, but I think we can uh, persevere. Maybe if I do that. Nope, just not gonna do it. It's saying, Chili, fuck you. Go fuck yourself. Unless I know, because Rectef would be underlined if it didn't know about it. Alright, let's look it up then. We'll get old school on this motherfucker. Alright, so we do not have a constructor. Oh, we... No, we don't have a constructor from two points. So let's make one. Gosh darn it. 
inline wrecked. Uh, underscore vec two T P zero underscore vec two T P one. So what this will do is it'll uh, it's going to expect vectors of the same type as our rectangle. If it gets vectors of a different type, it'll use vec2's uh, conversion operator to convert them automatically for us. So that'll be nice. Now we can't just say, you know, top is equal to uh, p0 uh, dot y and left is equal to p0 dot x because we don't know the orientation of p0 and p1 right they could have p0 could be the top one or it could be the bottom so what we got to do is we got to do something like this bottom is equal to we could use max or we could use an if statement we we'll use an if statement We'll use max or we'll use an if statement. And I'll, just, I'll just use max. We'll simple it up. So top is equal to max of p0 dot y and no. Minimum up is lower dummy p0 dot y and p1 dot y. Bottom is equal to minimum of same. Why did I say minimum? Why am I purposely trying to sabotage my own programming here? Left is equal to minimum of p0 dot x, p1 dot x, and right is equal to maximum of same. All right. I could have done this a little differently, actually. I could have used the initializer, and, or I could have invoked one of these, this, this one with this one. I'm gonna do it that way. OCD! Revenge of the OCD. We'll just call it like this. You couldn't do this in normal C++. This is C++11 stuff, man. It's worth it. Top, bottom, left, right. Okay, so we copy paste, copy that, paste it, getting so hungry, and do that, 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 how's that, I like that better, there we go. So now we got our rectangle constructor all set up. Let's go back. Go back, 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 back. Here we go. So now we do, uh, uh, I don't know, previous and current. We create our aligned axis bounding box for our line segment. And then we do if object aligned axis bounding box dot ah oh, give me a break damn it okay we need a function for uh, rectangles looks like we're today is upgrading rectangle day inline bool overlaps constant Okay, I'm just gonna copy and paste from my old code here because I'm pretty sure I got it in here somewhere Where's my rectangle? Contains overlaps. There we go Control C All 
All right. So again, that's just the test if the top is less than the bottom, bottom greater than top, etc., etc. Just put that over there to make it a little more readable. And Bob's your uncle. Fuck. I didn't say you could expand there. All right. Now let's see if we can do our bullshit. Dot overlaps with line line access bounding box. Then we may proceed with the uh, with the dumb stuff. I think I messed it up a little bit. Sorry. Let's go back. Oh uh, no! Fine, I'll do it this way. Constant, rect, and what do we got here? Rect. I don't know why I didn't underline this rect stuff, cause, but whatever. And now this is working fine. So we do our overlapping test between our lined axis bounding boxes, and we, if we decide that they are overlapping, then we have to, we must proceed with the. Uh, with the stuff. So now you're gonna, now we get to do the, uh, the intersection between a circle and a line, right? Wrong. Because, um, there's one more test we can do which will eliminate, again, some things, improving performance, and also, you know, prevent bad stuff from happening. But basically, we've got a circle here. And let's say it's already overlapping for reasons. Now, if its velocity is leaving and it's overlapping, and then we do the, the reflection, it's going to be going this way again, which is going to make it go deeper, like here. And then it's going to try to rebound and go this way, and it's going to go out a little bit. It's going to go in, out, in, out. And basically the idea is it's going to get stuck in the wall. So what we want to do is we want to say we only want to rebound if we are approaching the wall. If we're leaving the wall, just let us go. Just let us free. Don't, don't do any collision stuff. He's already leaving. Get him the fuck out of there. So how do we determine whether or not we are approaching the wall? Very simple again. We just do our dot product. We dot, we dot the the uh, the velocity of the circle with the normal of the wall, and if the dot product is negative, that means that they're going in opposite directions, and that's good. But if the dot product is positive, that means they're going in the same direction. Bad. We have to, it's the bad touch, we gotta leave. No more collision, this conversation is over. So, we need to do a dot producty thing. Let's look at my good old thingamajig. Where's the triangle vector entity? Process collision, let's go there. Let's do that. Go to definition. Here it is. Okay. So the first thing we do in here, we get the, the current vertice. And we do, we get the line bounding box if it overlaps. So now we need to get the normal and we need to get the velocity. So... Getting the velocity is fine. I'm just gonna, I'm gonna const this up because I love my consts. And I'm super hungry. Might have to pause the video and get some eats. Brain is starting to, wait, starting? Anyways, uh, we need to be able to get the velocity of our, uh, our uh, collidable circle. So, we go to Collidable Circle, we add another virtual vec2, get velocity, let's call it get vel, again constant, 
equal to zero. And so, we go vec to make it constant. Object velocity equals uh, object dot get velocity. Now again, this is this is assuming that uh, our uh, polyclosed here is not moving because we don't have movable polyclosed, so everything has to be fixed down. If it's not fixed down, that's a whole different ball game. We got to worry about conservation of momentum and all that happy course crap, relative velocities, and so we're just assuming that it's not moving, which is fine for a level and stuff, which is what we're using it for. So we need constant vec2 and we need line normal. And that is going to be equal to, okay, to get the normal of the line, what we want to do Where's my Where's my drawing board? My name is Simon and I like to do drawings. All right, so we got our line segment here. It's got two points. We'll call them last and cur. They're vectors. So to get a vector that's in this direction, uh, you do cur minus last. That'll get you this vector here. We'll call it line. We'll call it seg for segment. Okay, now to get the normal, you want to rotate segment. Uh, what is this? This is clockwise. You want to rotate segment clockwise by 90 degrees. And rotating by 90 degrees is very fast for vectors. Just want to let you know that. Uh, and that will get us our... Uh, normal only the length will be wrong so you want to then normalize this by dividing it by its own length so to wrap up you want to do current minus last which will get you your segment and then you want to uh, rot rotate clockwise by 90 degrees or if you are a civilized person, pi over 2, and then you want to divide that by basically the length of current minus last. So you want to normalize it at the end. I have a function to do that, so we'll just do it that way. Uh, where's my, where's my stuff? Where's my code? So line normal is going to be equal to uh, current minus, oh, it's previous, not last, whatever. Current minus previous dot, and we want to rotate it clockwise by 90 degrees. Now my clockwise and my counterclockwise might be fucked up because I might have written them with normal Cart Cartesian coordinates in mind and then you know because the screen flips the y-axis that might have fucked up my thing but I don't know we'll see we'll see it'll be a surprise uh, so we rotate it and then we want to normalize that to make it length of one and that'll give us our line normal and then I believe we just do the dot product between our normal and our uh, velocity and we check to see if that is negative because if it is negative then that means we're approaching the line and we can continue so we do if uh, object velocity and dot product I just overloaded the uh, multiplication operator between vectors for dot product line normal is less than 
0, 0.0 f and I it's not object it's Ojibwe there we go and now we have uh, passed phase two of our rigorous screening process we've established that the aligned axis bounding boxes overlap and that the the uh, the, the circle is approaching the line segment so now we can finally calculate our intersection points. And for that, we will, we will actually create our own function. But before we do that, it's now uh, about one hour and 30 minutes in and I need food. So I am gonna go eat, I'm gonna stuff my face. I'm gonna stuff the food into my food hole and when I'm done that, maybe I'll be back. We'll see. So I'm back and it's time for us to do the... Uh, do the maths. So let's do some intersection. Intersection... Uh, between circle and line. And that'll take us to Wolfram here. And we get some interesting uh, factoids. So this uh, expression here will give us the x and the y's. Actually, we got plus and minus here, so that's two x's and two y's. Uh, defining two points of intersection. We get some uh, defined variables here that go into these expressions. And uh, definition of a function here, the, the sine function. Uh, discriminant. And discriminant can tell us information about uh, what kind of intersection we have. Whether we have uh, no intersection, exactly one point of intersection, tangent, uh, two points, etc. Now it's interesting to note about, or I shouldn't say interesting, but important to note that these expressions, they assume that the circle is at uh, zero, zero. So in our situation, we're going to have to see the x and the y, x1, y1, x2, y2, are relative, basically relative to the circle, which is at zero, zero. Now our circle is not at zero, zero, so what we're going to have to do is subtract our circle's uh, position from the positions of the two points of the line segment. And that'll let us get our intersection using these uh, equations here. Now, I'm not gonna rewrite this whole thing from scratch because it's, I'll probably fuck many things up and it'll be bad. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna go into chili math here. And we are going to go into my, my prototype here. We're going to find, calculate intersection points. And we're going to go to definition. We'll copy this. Copy and put this one in intersection points. Now I'm wondering if I should make this uh, if I should make this a template or just make it a vec2. I think I'll make it a template. Template. It'll at least work with doubles and floats then. Uh, type name. Yeah. Okay. And type name, we need a type name here. Type name T. And here we go underscore vec2 T. Copy that. Q P1 P2. So Q is going to be the center of the circle, R is the radius of the circle. Make that a T. 
we're going to have to include, oh, uh, this is bad, because we have to include vector in here, but vector includes, what we need to do, we, we can either put this in the vector header, which makes sense because it's kind of a most, it's mostly a vector operation, or we could make a separate CPP file and put this in the CPP, but I think I'll just put this in the vector. So we'll go down to vec2. Stop it, there we go. Go to the end, we'll put this in here. Now this has to be in line. If you got a normal function and you want to put it in the H file, you got to make it in line. Otherwise, I'd have to make a separate CPP file. That's just the way it is. All right. So the VEC2 is not turning green, and I don't know why, but we'll ignore that for now. R. Okay, so we create a vector. of these, and that'll be our points. Now, oh, I got so many Vec 2s in here, man. Gotta replace all this bullshit. I don't understand why this isn't turning blue. What if I get rid of that? That didn't help at all. And put that back. What if I include vector? That's better. Now we're cooking with. We're gonna make this inline. <clears throat> Not to get rid of this, maybe. Nope. Nope, nope, nope. Got rid, get rid of that. Okay, that got rid of that. Good. Let's continue, shall we? All right. <clears throat> so D is equal to P2 minus P1. Uh, where's, our, where's our math? Yeah, here we go. We got DX and DY, which is just X2 minus X1, Y2 minus Y1. Uh, so that can be, you know, put into one big uh, vector. The X and the Ys can be consolidated into a vector. Now dr is going to be the distance of d, the length of d. Uh, but if we look down here, when we don't use dr itself, we use dr squared. And it's faster, it's less work to take the... Uh, the length squared of a vector than to take the actual length. That's because if you take the length, you have to do a square root to get that. Whereas if you take the length squared, no square root, so it's faster. So we calculate d, we pre-calculate d, we pre-calculate dr squared, uh, capital D. That is, this thing here is called a determinant. I'm not going to go into that, that's math stuff. But the determinant of x1, x2, y1, y2 is equal to this thing, x1 times y2 minus x2 times y1. This thing is what's called a cross product. So if you have two vectors, v and u, and you take the cross product of them, you're basically getting... Uh, Vx times uy minus uh, ux times vy, or whatever, which is equal to uh, length of v, length of u, sine theta. So it's closely related to uh, the dot product. Now here's something that's even more complicated. There isn't actually a real cross product in two dimensional. It's not really defined. Uh, so this is like a pseudo cross product. The real cross product is in three dimensions and it 
that uh, you cross two vectors and you get out a vector. It's also called the vector product. But in two dimensions, the, uh, the bastardized version only gives you a number. Hmm. So like uh, dot product, you get the projection here, right? So the number, if you have two vectors like this and you dot product them, the answer is going to be zero because you don't, there's no projection because they're right angles. Whereas with the cross product, uh, you cross them and you get the biggest number. The cross product of two vectors going the same direction is going to be zero. Whereas the cross product of two, or the dot product of two vectors in the same direction is going to be just the, the, uh, the product of their lengths. So they're kind of, they kind of come in a pair, cross product, dot product. They're cousins. They're kissing cousins. Alright, so... What I'm trying to say is this D thing is actually just... Um, X cross Y. Not X cross Y. Um, V1 cross V2. Oh, I didn't want to do that. Oh, I totally didn't want to do that. Now I fucked it up. There we go. Good. Let's get rid of this. All right. So here's what we do. This is the big D. We do P1 minus Q cross P2 minus Q. We have to subtract Q, remember, because our uh, P1 and P2 are relative to the center of the circle. We didn't have to subtract Q up here because we were just going from P1 to P2. It doesn't matter. The circle doesn't matter in that case. In this case, it's very important that we subtract Q from both P1 and P2, bringing these points, their value, relative to the circle. Now we come to the discriminant, which is this thing here, this delta which is r squared times dr squared minus uh, big D squared. Uh, this will discriminate the uh, what kind of solution we get. So we just calculate that based on the stuff we've already calculated. And now we're ready to check. What we want to do is we want to check to see if the discriminant is greater than or equal to zero. Because if the discriminant is less than zero, means we have no answers. And so we just return an empty vector. Now if the discriminant is exactly equal to zero, we're going to get two answers that are identical, the same point. So it's actually just one point. And if the discriminant is greater than zero, we get two answers, the two uh, points of intersection. So what we do is we just calculate a bunch of intermediate results here. Uh, what do we call it? Square root of the distance, or the square root of the discriminant. And I just get the square root of the discriminant here. So that's, uh, this is the discriminant. This is the square root of the discriminant. You see it appears in both the x and the y. And then I have the left-hand side for x and the right-hand side for x. I split them up, you'll see why in a second. Uh, left-hand side and the right-hand side. That's the left, the side on the left and the right of the plus-minus here. And we calculate the left-hand side of the y, the right-hand side for the y. And that's, again, this and this. Uh, and then I push back our two points, which is going to be the left-hand side for the x and the right-hand side for the x, divided by dr2, left-hand side for the y, right-hand side for the y. Oh, and here, okay, so that's interesting. I actually did, uh, I did solve for the case where uh, the discriminant is exactly zero. So in the case that the discriminant is exactly zero, we only push one answer onto the... Uh, onto the vector, but if the discriminant is greater than zero, we push the second answer, which is going to be uh, left-hand side minus right-hand side, and left-hand side minus. So you see, this is the plus, this is the minus. That's why we split it up. We can do the plus and the minus, get the two answers, without recalculating these uh, intermediates. And very important, because I fucked this up when I was doing it myself, and it cost me lots of time debugging. Here, we subtract Q, right? 
to uh, get our positions relative to the center of the circle. You have to add Q back at the end to get your uh, position, again, not relative to the circle, but back into uh, world space. And then we just return the points. Now I'm going to change this. I'm going to make this um, so that it returns a R value reference. Just to make it a little more efficient in certain, in certain cases, maybe. I just make it explicit that I want to move the values, not copy them. Now this should work, except for one problem. We don't have SGN, this function doesn't exist. Um, it says it's defined here as uh, negative one for x less than zero, otherwise one. So what we want to do is, we want to copy it from my project here. So we go to Chili Math, and uh, let's see, these are not important. Where is it? Quadratic roots, that's not important. Okay, here it is, SGN, the sine function. And you guys can just copy this. Um, we'll put it in Chili Math. I'll make it match my other stuff. I'll put this one type name. And it just compares. It does some crazy com com comparing math here. It'll subtract. Mm, it's hard to explain how this works. But if the value is less than or equal to zero, this will be true, so it'll be one. And here, if the value is less than zero, this will be true, so it'll be one. So if the value is less than zero, one minus one, zero, right? If the value is greater than zero, We have one minus, that's weird. What was it again? I'm getting confused. It's negative one. So here, if the value is less than zero, we have zero minus one, negative one. The answer is negative one. If it's greater than zero, we have one minus zero, right? Because if it's greater than zero, then this is going to be false. One minus zero, one. And if it's exactly zero, we have one minus zero, so it's still one, which is exactly what we want given this definition. And the beauty of doing it this way instead of using an if statement is using no branching. It's very, uh, very fast. So it's just a way of writing this function without having to use any branching which is good. Let's continue. Now we have, wait, what, why did I do that? Why did I do that too? Uh, we want to go back all the way to the year. Where is it? Uh, where's Vector? Here it is. Okay. So now this uh, SGN function is defined. Absolute is fine. Okay, this vec two has got to go. It's got to be a. Uh, it's got to be one of these. I know I'm just gonna. I'm gonna get, do all this bullshit, and then it's gonna turn out that for some reason I just can't do it with uh, templates. This has got to be a T. Got to replace this one and this one. Keys, and I think that's it. So if the compiler doesn't object, we should be fine. And now we have calculate intersection points, which is what we've always wanted. Let's go to vector entity here. I get the velocity in here. Makes sense, I guess. If velocity times normal. Right, so now we want to calculate intersection points.
copy that. Uh, and that was not what I wanted to do. Let's go to thrust. And let's go to wherever thrust is doing important work, which is in uh, polyclosed, I guess. Yes, there we go. All right. So let's do this. We got to get a vector, fill it up with vectors, which are our points. Could make it constant, doesn't matter. I'll do that. Uh, now, calculate intersection points requires the uh, the center of our circle, which we will get up here. Constant. Uh, circle center. I ah, just call it C, whatever. Constant vec to C is equal to object dot get center. We'll have to implement that at some point. Uh, current vertice, last vertice, vertice C. We'll just call that cur and prev. Don't get that mixed. Don't get that backwards because that's perv. And what else? We need a radius. So, constant float r is equal to object dot get radius. Precalculate that. And now we have our vector of points. So let's go uh, back here and see what happens. So now we check to see if points.size is equal to two. If it's equal to just one, then that means we're just touching. We haven't actually collided yet. We're just, we're just kissing. No fighting, only kissing. So let's put this test in here. And if size is equal to two, then that means we must be colliding with the uh, with the line of our line segment. But that does not mean that we're colliding with the line segment itself. And let me just uh, elaborate on that idea. Let's say we've got a circle. I'm going to try to draw a decent circle. More this way. Okay, that wasn't too bad. And let's say that circle has a uh, bounding box. So let's draw a bounding box around our circle. That's about right. That seems okay. And <clears throat> now we're going to draw a line. Yeah, that was kind of not a straight. We'll draw a straighter line that nah, and that's not the right angle. We'll draw a line like this. Here's our line segment that we're testing uh, collision with. Now, as we can see, our bounding boxes overlap. So we passed the first test. Uh, and let's say we're also approaching the line. Now, the next test we have to do is to check whether uh, we are colliding with or whether we are intersecting the line. So we take the equation of the line because that's what we use, the equation here and it's, it's really close but let's say that this actually does uh, intersect two points right here. You can see we'll get an intersection of two points in our solution, but we're not actually colliding with the line segment because the line segment isn't the line, it's only a portion of the line. So what we have to do is we have to take we have to take our two points of collision <clears throat> and we have to check whether they are on the line segment. Now the easiest way to do that is to check whether these 
two points are inside the bounding box of the line segment. Because if they are inside the bounding box, then they're on the line segment. So... <clears throat> that's what we do here. We, uh, we calculate two bools to see uh, whether the line bounding box contains point zero and point one. Now, in our uh, engine here, I don't think we have contains in rect yet. Let's go to rect. Yeah, we don't have contains. So we do inline. And let's make it a template, because, hey, why the fuck not? Uh, type name T2. And we want to do uh, inline bool contains underscore vec2 t2 point p const. And we return, let's see, p dot x less than we'll do p dot y fuck that p dot y greater than top and p dot x less than fuck that p dot y less than bottom and p dot x greater than left and p dot y less than right. Now I'm going to make these greater than or equal to, because I, I will uh, interpret being on the line as being contained inside the rectangle. There we go. All right, so here's our contains function. It will serve us well, undoubtedly. Wait, what the fuck? Why is there an inline here? That can go. Eat all of the dicks. Alright, now we want... Let's copy some more bullshit from our... Prototype here. Constant bool... Uh... I don't even know why I called this con... Con S contains I guess well that's good enough for me contains zero and this should be line line axis bounding box contains points zero and contains points at one <clears throat> so we calculate these two and for now Let's just say, this isn't, this isn't the right answer, by the way. It's a little more complicated. But for now, we're just going to say that if one of those points of contact, or points of intersection, are on the line segment, then we are colliding with the line. So we're going to do if cons 0 or cons 1, then we are colliding. And in order to collide, what do we do? Well, we have to, this is the part where we do our collision correction, which is to say that we, uh, we reflect the velocity of the circle. Hmm. So I'm going to copy that for no good reason. So we need a function called rebound in our uh, collidable circle interface. And the normal is going to be line normal right here. So line normal. 
and all the uh, all the circle needs is it needs to know the normal for the rebound and it can calculate its reflection after that all right and here's getting out of this test getting out of this test overlap test and at the end of this we simply move on to the next vertice I guess the next line segment I should say uh, let me just check to make sure we don't like abort I don't think we do I right, just say collide is equal to true right and then so we just we keep uh, processing line segments we don't want to stop at just one because we might have another collision that we have to handle and stopping at just one would be bad so what we're gonna do is for the next iteration of the loop we have to update the previous so previous is now equal to current and then current will be equal to the next uh, the iterator which is gonna to point to the next one and so forth now we need to implement a couple more uh, functions in collidable circle we need our get center get radius and rebound so we'll go to collidable circle virtual float get uh, radius const zero virtual vec two get center const equals zero what else oh yeah and rebound so virtual void rebound float what do we want no it's got to be vec2 vec2 normal equal to zero and it's not constant this is the only one that isn't constant because we have to this function obviously changes the state of the circle changes its velocity to be uh, to be precise and I think that's all the interface functions that we need for a collidable circle now let's go back here we've lost all of our red underlines that's good um, what we want to do is what do we want to do now I guess we want to implement uh, these interface functions in our ship now so where's ship here it is let's look at our class view and we're gonna go down to circle I think it's up here right collision collidable circle and it'll give us a list of functions that I can refer to so we got our public interface I'm just gonna add a new section here uh, collidable interface all right so rect f our virtual access bounding box const override because we're overriding a virtual function that already exists albeit a pure virtual and we want to return a new rect f based on all right so this rect f is interesting it's going to be uh, based on the radius in the center of our circle so we're going to do it like how should we define it uh, I guess we'll just define it by the four points so the top is going to be wait a minute where's our ship position okay so top is going to be position dot y minus shield radius and then we want 
bottom position dot y plus shield radius and position dot x minus shield radius and position dot x plus shield radius I can't believe I typed it all in without fucking anything up my mom would be so proud of me all right. So that'll get our aligned axis bounding box for our ship. Let's continue. Virtual. What do we got here? Get center. That's a. F that's a vec two. Center const override. And we want to return position. Virtual. Get radius, that's a float. Const override. Return shield radius. Virtual vec2 get velocity. Const override. Return vl. And last one, but certainly not the least one, rebound. Virtual void rebound vec2 normal override, not constant. Okay, so you guys remember what I told you about... about stuff we got our uh, our collision surface we got our colliding motherfucker we got the velocity that it has before collision we've got the velocity that it has after collision we got the normal to the surface and basically what we do is if this is uh, if this is velocity V this is normal n hat we do V dot n hat to get the projection of this in the normal and we multiply by n hat again to get the vector in the basically in this direction it's gonna be this vector here we multiply it by 2 to double it and then we subtract that'll be right here then we subtract it to get this vector so we gotta subtract that from v very simple so it's velocity minus two times velocity dot normal times normal so we can do that like this Where's my thing? Here it is. Velocity minus and equals 2.0 f times velocity dot normal times. I don't know if this is going to be. Wait, times normal. Normal. I don't know if I'm going to allow to. Yeah, I can't. It's got to be normal. It's basically the way I don't have an operator defined for uh, scalar times vector. I only have vector times scalar. So I've got to do it uh, normal times this. And make sure that this is evaluated first. Hmm. Oh, yeah. And this one has to go. At the end, that's fine. Can I get away with this? I don't see why not. Sure, I can. There we go. So we get the projection length. We scale the uh, normal vector by that length to get the projection vector. 
and we double it and we subtract it from the velo original velocity to reflect in the uh, the plane of the collision surface. Yes, I somehow found my way to the end of that sentence. All right, and that should be that. Let's see if I can build this. Hopes are not high. Alright. Binary. No operator found which takes type vec float or there's no. Hmm. Ah. That would be a problem. That would also be a problem. Let's try that again. Ooh, we got... Yeah, see, here's the thing about... Using vectors. Length squared is not a member of vec2 float. Really? Because I'm pretty sure it is. Or wait, did I... Not put... No, okay, it's lens... Okay, whatever. Fuck you, man. I renamed it. There. Are you happy now? Probably not. There's probably more. Uh, cross is not a member of, right? Because it's cross with, right? Is that what you're going to try to tell me? Why did I even change that? I should have left it as cross. Okay, we got warnings, but I don't like those. Conversion from const int to float. Possible loss of data. Where? I don't see it. Oh, what happened? Come back. Okay, shield radius returns float, but it's in... Okay, yeah, we need floats for this, so we'll, we'll convert that. And we'll rebuild it. Okay, now we have something that builds... Will it actually work? That is another problem altogether. I'm going to say no. Even if it works, it's still not going to work properly because I haven't... As I mentioned before, we still got work to do. But, let's give it a shot. Now, in order to, to give it a shot, we've got to actually process this bullshit. So, we get an update model. We do start watch. We do ship.update. And then we got to do map dot that's dumb all right okay we gotta go to map I'm gonna add a function here void handle collision uh, collidable circle and object and we will call model dot handle collision object we just pass that along to our internal poly closed model now we'll go back go back more why there we go now we go to map dot handle collision we'll pass it to ship because ship inherits from collidable circle and this should give us some kind of collision all right it's time for the moment of truth how bad is this gonna fuck up okay so we passed right through it and then we got an unhandled exception which is bad in many ways. All right, here comes the point in the story when I get to debug. <clears throat> this is what happens when you copy and paste code from one project into one similar but somewhat different project. Or maybe I just typed something in wrong. Anyways. Uh, what is your problem here? Calculate intersection points. Points size is equal to zero. If points dot size is equal to two. Uh, 
Okay, I don't understand why we get a uh, whatever error we got there. Operation completed successfully. Unhandled exception. Hmm. That is somewhat... Operation completed successfully. See, that's the thing. You see, if you say it's completed successfully, that doesn't seem like a... much of an exception. Mm. I am very disappointed. Let's put a breakpoint here. And we'll try. Looks like our clockwise and counterclockwise are backwards, first of all. Which is going to cause us problems. I should fix that. Let's make this counterclockwise, first of all. All right, now we're going to try this. Better. Okay, at least we're uh, triggering on the right points here. So, like I said before, I got my rotations fucked up. I'll have to fix that somehow. <clears throat> now let's jump into calculating uh, the intersection points. Uh, okay, so we got some constructors and bullshit. Step out of that. Step in that, step out, step in, out, in. It's worth noting that that kind of stuff gets uh, removed when you uh, do the release build and it does optimization. Okay, so we got a vector of points. They are zero. Vec2, D is equal to. It's a float vector, which is what we want. This is good. This seems good to me. I don't know. These numbers mean nothing to me, but they seem good. Uh, now we want to check the discriminant is greater than or equal to zero. It's most definitely not. So we return move points. And that somehow doesn't make our compiler happy at all. Axis violation writing location zero zero. So perhaps, perhaps my understanding of how uh, how the uh, the move works is not not the greatest. We're gonna try something here. We're going to go into this. I'll admit, I, I'm kind of uh, pulling a lot of this stuff out of my ass. I'm not super sure about all this R value shit, but I figured that would work. I guess the problem is you return an R value reference to this thing, but this thing gets destroyed. So, yeah. Although I thought that would work, but I guess it doesn't. Well, I guess we're going to just do a copy. To be honest, the uh, the compiler usually optimizes this anyways. I thought, I thought this would allow me to return, to move by returning from the function. I don't know. I don't know, man. Let's, uh, let's see if it still fucks up. Because if it fucks up after this, then I don't know. Okay, so now we just get nothing. That is not better. Let's make sure I didn't do anything super dumb in here. Points, points, okay, lots of points. All right, um... We need to set a break point. Chili needs a breakpoint right here. And let's go.
Okay. So points is equal to zero. That's fine because the first time we're probably not going to... That's just when our uh, aligned axis bounding boxes have overlapped. And we're not going to get into it yet. And size is not equal to two. So we continue. Let's continue to the next time when we get a... Fuck. Okay. Here's the problem with debugging this bullshit. Uh, what happens is you get time steps. Let's go into game here. You get super huge time steps because the time that is advanced in the uh, update depends on the time between the frames. And if you're debugging, you're going to spend a lot of time between two frames and your ship is going to jump like all the way outside of the world. So what we want to do is we want to update with a... Uh, when we're in debug mode, we want to update with a standard time here. Let me just see if I can do this. Hmm. Hmm. I don't know if end debug is actually... Yeah, I think it is. So if we switch this over to release, we see that this becomes active. Now if we switch it to debug, this becomes active. A little bit of uh, preprocessor bullshit. I don't like putting the preprocessor in here because it makes everything ugly, but meh, I'll do it anyways. <sighs> okay, now we just put DT in here. Okay, let's try that again. All right, so we go in here. And we continue. Hmm. Size is still equal to zero. Continue. Size is equal to zero. Continue. So our ship is moving every time. It's moving, 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 moving. Bah! Ugh, we are super in there and still we're not getting our intersection points. That is disheartening, to say the least. That means that our uh, calculate intersection points function is fucking up somehow. So what we're going to do is we're going to stop. And we're going to go. Uh, I can't get this all in here. I can't let you guys see everything. So I'll let you see what you can. Fuck that. Get this one on here. And we'll just give her a little love tap in this direction. Let her slowly drift. And we'll trigger the allowing axis bounding box. That's working fine. We can see that that's definitely bounding box overlapping. Uh, continue, 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 continue. Yes, get closer, get in there. And size equal to zero. I should put this here. make sure Keep going 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 all right so we should definitely be over oh we got we got size equal to two we're in there okay so it is working well it's not working but at least the uh, the calculate intersection points is working Size is equal to 2, right when uh, we should expect it. Let's step into this mother. And we do the contains false. Okay, so maybe my contains function, I fucked it up. 
false because I mean that should ugh, I can't even see it uh, that should clearly be true this should clearly contain in here uh, line aabb dot contains yeah unless the points themselves are somehow wrong so let's look at points that means nothing to me. Well, where's my center? Center is at 2301, 2346. That seems right. Right, it's further to the left. And 130 is a little bit down. I can't see anything until I step forward. Bullshit. Uh, what else? Okay, so the points seem... They seem... Like, fine, really. 4, 6, 4, 2, yeah, they seem normal. Uh, what about line A, A, B, B? Let's check that out. Where is it? Where's my locals? Line A, A, B, B. Top is 27. Bottom is 2. Okay, that's... F no, wait, that's, that's, that's fine. That's why. Why is that? And X is this. So between 2363 and 2325. Now, where's our dumb bullshit from here? Points. 234, 2363. I guess it seems like these are in between there. I've already forgot. 2346, 2342. 234. Yeah, that's fine. So. Points are definitely inside the aligned axis bounding box, which means my algorithm just, I just fucked up a simple function. That's it. I hope so. I hope that's it. Let's go to the definition. All right. Yeah. P Y greater than top. Uh, excuse me. Wait, no, that makes sense. P Y should be greater than. Yeah, that, that's fine. And point Y less than bottom. Yeah, that's fine. Greater than left and less than or equal to right. Okay, so this is a Y and that should definitely be an X. That's probably going to be what was fucking it up. Just, just a random guess here, people, but... Uh, Seems plausible to me. All right, let's uh, let's try this again. All right, we're gonna take this breakpoint off, and we're gonna roll, and we get bounce back. Look at that. Was that beautiful or what? Let's try that again. Oh, it looks so good. Oh, it's making me so horny. What do you what do you think about that? Do you think we got a little bit of physics going on here? I think so. But our jobs are not yet done. You might be thinking, man, this looks pretty good to meet you. I think uh, this is uh, mission accomplished. Put up the banner. Get on that aircraft carrier. But no. I'm going to show you why this is kind of fucked up as soon as I can get my ship under control here. Let's see if we can hit this thing at the very corner. Wait. Wait. That actually worked, which is kind of bad, because that ruins my whole... Hmm... It's kind of hard to tell, actually. Let's see if I can... I gotta get it at, a, like, a weird angle to, to show you. Unless, unless something's wrong with my thinking and it's actually totally fine, in which case I'll be... I'll be fucked. Alright. I need to get at a good corner, like this one. And I need to get it at a right, just a perfect angle. No, that didn't help. Ah, so much fucking around. Video is already super long, so why don't you just fucking give me what I want? Yeah, did you see that? Did you see that? Because that was what I'm talking about. So basically, um, let me explain it here. 
if you didn't catch that, then you just rewind the video and look at it again, because I'm not going to try to get that uh, phenomenon to occur again, because it'll waste a bunch of time. And time is money. And money is the root of all evil, and you know the rest. Misogyny. But I joke. Let's get back to business. Um, so what happened there? What, what went wrong in Chile Land today? This is getting to be a fucking long video, man. <sighs> but we got a soldier on. Ain't got no time. So here's our thing. And uh, you can tell the video's getting long because I'm getting super articulate now. Our thing. Real specific, like. Okay, where's a fucking... There it is. Okay, so here is a circle. That's not even close to what a circle should be looking like. And okay, that's good enough. <clears throat> and we're coming at it like this. I want to disable snapping because that's pissing me off. Anyways, uh, we're coming at it like this. And we're just glancing. Oh, this fucking circle is so ugly. Okay, I'm sorry. I have to, I have to make a good circle. It's time to make a circle. Remember 3.14159. I can't remember the next. Maybe it's a five? Wait, no, that was there's already a five in there. It's closer. So we're coming at it like this. Now if we glance it, we should expect if we take a glancing blow here, we should expect to hit it like this and come off maybe a little bit this way. So we come at it like this. Do a glancing blow and then we come at it like this. But what we're actually doing is we're hitting it, we're hitting it on a glancing blow and then we're coming off like this. The reason is, is we're using this normal as our ref fuck, as our reflection fucking oh, whatever. We're using this normal here as our reflection normal. So no matter how we hit this line segment, we're always going to reflect like this with this normal and that's fine if we hit it anywhere from here to here and that's not a good explanation you know what i mean <laughs> that's not a good explanation either but uh if we're hitting it in the middle that's fine but if we hit the the edge of it we're no longer colliding with a line segment we're actually colliding with a point and colliding with a point is different because, fuck, I hate layers. I just fucking hate them. All of my hate for your layer. Alright, here's the normal. Here's the fucking point. Suck my cock. Okay. So if we're just hitting here, it's always gonna, the normal's always gonna be this direction, but if we if we start hitting it on the side here, or on the very edge of the line segment, then obviously the point, the, the force is going to be acting this way. When we hit it right on the surface, force is always acting in the same direction, the normal. But when we hit it on the end, force is going to act from the end point to the center point of the circle. So in this case, we have to, the normal is going to be different. It's going to be dependent on from here to here. But how do we determine whether or not we are colliding with the, the flat surface or whether we're colliding with the, uh, the edge, the end point? That's the trick. And I've come up with a pretty good solution. I haven't actually like proven it out to be 100% uh, accurate in all cases, but... From what I can see from a lot of eyeball testing, I haven't seen it do anything really dumb. So, I'm going to assume that my solution works. Now, how it works is, well, we, we get the cons 0 and cons 1. Now. To determine if we've collided with the end of with an end point, we do this test. 
we check if, first of all, if uh, cons 0 is not equal to cons 1, meaning false true or true false. Now, what does that mean, even? Well, in most cases, what that's going to mean is... Where's my thing? Here's our line segment points. And uh, here's a circle. Here's another circle. Right? Here's the actual line. Just extend it here from the line segment. Now, cons 0 and cons 1 mean that both points are on the line segment or are off the line segment. So if they're both true, then that means that both points on the line segment. If both points are on the line segment, then we've definitely collided with uh, the, uh, the surface and out the end point. That just, that just makes sense to me. However, if one point is off the line segment and one point is on, then we have a situation where uh, it's quite possible that we've actually hit the end point. But it's not, that's not total proof. I mean, you could have a situation like this, where one is just barely off and one is really on, and that's probably going to be, uh, it's probably going to be a face collision, not an end point. So how do we determine whether it's face or end point? What I do is I take the midpoint of these two points and I check to see if that midpoint is also on the, uh, on the line segment. If the midpoint is on the line segment, then I just say, yeah, it's probably a face collision. It might not even always be true. There might be certain special cases we, we hit it at the right angle from the right position where... Uh, you can get a wrong solution there, but it's right enough of the time to make it not really matter. <laughs> At least that's what uh, that's how I do it. So we just check to see whether uh, they're different and whether um, the uh, the line uh, the line bounding box contains the midpoint between our two points of uh, intersection. And if it doesn't contain the midpoint, and it contains one point but not the other point, then we say, okay, we are colliding with the, the end point, and we do end point collision. And that's what this is. This is all end point collision. And here, if either of these are colliding, then that means that uh, we're doing, uh, what is it? We're doing collision with the face. If one or the other is colliding. Because you have the case where one is colliding and the midpoint is also on the line. So, or you have the case where they're both colliding. Now, if you have the case where... Uh, neither of the points, the uh, intersection points, are on the line segment. False, false. This will be false. This will also be false, and you'll just have no collision. So, now that my throat is getting incredibly raw from talking for so long, water time, let's copy over this code. And then I will uh, we'll fix it up, and I'll explain as we go along, because there's still a little bit more to this uh, whole rigmarole. <clears throat> so we're going to copy, we'll paste this into here, put that in there, and... Uh, you guys can, you know, pause the video and, well, I guess you don't want to copy this because I still have stuff to do. But you get the idea. Okay, so we got, first we check to see if, it's basically an exclusive or, right? This one, uh, but not this one, or this one, but not this one. Both of them being true is not going to satisfy, and both of them being false is not going to satisfy. And that's fine. Now here we need to rename 
line aligned axis bounding box dot contains and I do have that function points zero midpoint two okay so there's no function midpoint two let's see if I just renamed it let's see if I renamed it to midpoint because I might have done that no I didn't okay let's go to vector and did I not midpoint with whatever why did I even bother renaming this shit I don't even know sometimes I do not know what's going on okay so that fixes it fixes this so now we get the midpoint between our two points of intersection we check that it is not contained in the aligned axis bounding box and if it is not contained and if this is also true then we're gonna do our collision with an endpoint so first we need uh, to define some vec 2s d1 and d2 what are they uh, these are let's uh, let's diagram this because it'll be better all right let's just get rid of these layers start with a fresh slate and I'm definitely gonna go I might I might be able to make it within three hours for this video but it's gonna be close so we've got point here point here we've determined that we are on an end point here Blech. Wait, that's no good. That's better, I guess. Here's our points of intersection. Here's our midpoint, which is just outside of the... Uh, outside of the... whatever. I don't want all those dumb points. Here's our midpoint. Just outside of the line segment. Here is the, uh, the center point of our circle. Now D1 and D2. Fuck that. Are going to be uh, vectors from the center of our circle to our vertices, which are the end points of our line segments. So going back here. D1 and D2 are just this vector and this vector. And we create these vectors. And then, what do we do? Go back here. And this is wrong. It should be uh, previous and current. And then we get the squares of the lengths. And this is going to be len sq because I'm retarded and I renamed it for some reason. Len squared. Okay, now why do we do that? D squared closest. And we need one D closest. So what are we doing here? Well, what we're doing is... We're comparing uh, the distances. Let's go here. We're comparing the distances to the two endpoints to determine which endpoint we're probably colliding with. Because up until this point, we know that we're colliding with an endpoint, but we still can't tell which one it is. So we've got to determine which endpoint we're actually colliding with. And we do that by taking vectors from the center to each of the endpoints and seeing which one is closer. And if we do that, there it is. If we do that, uh, we, uh, we compare them here. And if d squared 1 is less than or equal to d squared 2, then d closest is going to be d1. That's the closest vector, uh, the closest endpoint vector. And the, uh, the square distance is going to be d squared 1, because we don't want to calculate that over again. So we just uh, we set uh, d closest and d squared closest. And the, the opposite is true if uh, d squared 2 is less than d squared 1. 
Now, the reason we're comparing d squared and not just the distance is because, like I said before, length squared is easier to calculate than just length. And if one thing is shorter than the other, then its squared length is also going to be the squared shorter than the squared length of the other. So we don't have to calculate that square root yet. So we first, we just calculate the squared length and compare them. And once we have that, then we check to see, here's another thing, we check to see whether or not we are approaching that, um, that point or whether we are actually leaving that point. Because it's possible to be approaching... Where's my... Uh, here it is. Just a little point here. It's possible, this is our normal, right? Fuck you. I want this. Get rid of that. Here's our, here's our surface, or our line. Here's our normal. If we've got a ball, fuck that. We've got a ball like, no, it's not colliding. We need a ball that we need a ball that's colliding or something. There we go. If we've got a ball that's going this way, it's actually approaching. If we do the dot product, it's approaching this line, but uh, it's actually going away from the point. So you can have situations where you're approaching the line, but you are going away from the point, the end point. And in such a situation. We don't want to do collision, so we just leave. But so what we do is we're comparing uh, the velocity yeah, the velocity of the object, we're doing a dot product with the velocity of the object and the vector, the position vector, uh, displacement vector from the object to the end point. And if it's less than zero, then again we are approaching the end point. And if we are approaching the end point, then we want to call a rebound, and it's going to be the normal is going to be just uh, where is it? Here it is. Actually, I guess I fucked it up. Looking at it now, it looks as if the vectors are going in this direction, which makes sense. But regardless, what it's going to do is it's going to normalize this uh, vector by dividing it by its own length. Or no, wait, it doesn't divide it by its own length. It's going to square root it to get the length. Because right now, this is length squared. It's going to square root it, and then it's going to divide by that square root and to normalize it. So we get a vector that is of length 1.0f. And it's going to re return that as the normal for rebounding. So if you're just grazing this one, the vector for rebounding is going to be in this direction, the normal, instead of being in this direction. So assuming that your uh, your velocity is going this way, it's probably going to end up going... I don't know, maybe this way? I can't, I can't tell. But anyways, if it was uh, using this normal, it would be going uh, maybe more like like this way or something, I don't know. Fuck it. Fuck it all! <sighs> I'm getting tired. I want to be done this explaining shit. Alright, so we don't need to return true or false. I think. I could be wrong. Depends on it, whether we want uh, to return 
if we true or false if we've actually had a collision and this is just the case like i said before of if we're colliding with the, the thing itself so we just do uh we just do what line normal i guess that's what it is yeah all right I don't know why in the other one I was doing the uh, returning true or false depending on whether or not. Let's see, return here it returns collided, which is a boolean here, true or false. So I'm gonna look at this is a vector entity, so map, which I think was walls or something in walls. Process collision, it just returns this one. And process collision is on. It's gonna be in game. Ah, oh, fuck off. Where's game? There it is. And process collision. Do collision with map. Ship. Do collision with map. Well, fuck. Okay, let's go to ship then. Why did I do it this way? I'm not gonna do it this way this time. And where's do collision? Where's fucking do collision? Mm. There it is. And it just calls process collision on this and it ignores the return value. Which means that we don't need it right now. We can add it later if we want. But this is gonna be our function. Let's go. So let's see if I can hit... Uh, Let's see if I can hit one of those corners at a good angle to demonstrate that we have uh, good glancing abilities now. Fuck off! No! This is the part of the video where I just grunt into the microphone. Enjoy! Well, that seemed okay, but I'm not convinced yet. It was a little iffy. Now this is not going to be a good one, because I'm just going to hit the... Uh, fucking... Uh. I could, like, just set up a good position for this, but I'm not going to do that. This is not going to be good. Yeah, that wasn't a good one. Um, come back, come back, come back. Okay, now we're just going to bring her back this way. It's not good. No, it didn't, ooh, it didn't want to do that. Mmm, mmm, that's not good. Mmm, it doesn't feel good. It feels the opposite of good. Oh, mommy. Urgh. Now I'm getting frustrated. Okay. In a video that cannot afford to be any longer than it already is, I am fucking the goat on this. Fucking just let me... Oh, there we go. Okay, you saw that. You saw that. That was a glancing blow, and it was handled very nicely by our routine. And that's it. That is all I have today. I am spent. I am beyond spent. So, yeah. Now, we have to look into possibly, maybe, uh, fuck you. Uh, fix counterclockwise, clockwise. But I'm probably going to forget because that's what I do. Ah, uh, yeah. Because depending on whether our model is winding counterclockwise or clockwise, that will determine whether we want to rotate the thing. It's all not, it's not super clear in my head, I'm, I have to admit. I'm just kind of pulling it all out of my ass right now. But beyond that, I think we're looking pretty good. We've got our collision done. And... Uh, Eat a dick. Eat a bag of dicks in hell. I want to just fuck around with this thing while I... I give my closing remarks. No, it's uh, looking good. Um, and we can get uh, pretty good speed. There's obviously going to be... If you can... What's the word I'm looking for? If you can travel more than the diameter of the 
the diameter of the shield in one time step, you'll be able to tunnel through walls. And that's a bad thing. But all you have to do is just limit your game so that it... Uh, limit the top speed of your ship so that that doesn't become possible. That is an incredibly fast speed anyways, so... It's not a super big issue. However, you... Uh, Compound that with the fact that the uh, frame rate is variable depending on performance and issues like that. You have a re recipe for some tunneling and some shenanigans. Now this can, there's ways of fixing that of course, that's... Uh, there are better ways of handling the variable frame rate and so forth. But, for what we're doing right now, it's fine, it's fucking fine. Let's not worry about it so much. Um... Yeah, so next thing we're going to be doing is, I don't like, there's just too much wireframe, it's hard to keep, uh, it's hard to visualize the walls and everything. What we're going to do, let me show you, I'm going to show you my, uh, my prototype that I'm working on. Let's see if I can get this done. We're going to make the walls more solid. And to do that, we're going to need to uh, draw triangles and shit. There's a whole bunch of shit we're going to have to do. But that's what I want to do, because I want to teach you triangles, because triangles are another stepping stone on the way to 3D. So here's... Wait, what the fuck is this? Okay, I just opened the exact same project. Fuck that. Here is my uh, good stuff. All right. So here is what I've got going... And some of this stuff we might not get to depending on you guys, but you can see we have the solid walls here. The, the blur effect is not something we'll be doing next lesson. That'll be later if you guys want to go that far. But, um, or the bloom effect, I should say. But yeah, we're going to get the, uh, the solid walls is going to be next lesson. And that'll make it easier to visualize the world. It looks nicer with solid walls, I must admit. Uh, solid ship, we'll have to wait, because that's more complicated, actually. But, no, we'll work on, uh, uh we're gonna have to be able to draw triangles, and then we're gonna have to be able to generate our, uh, walls from our, uh, list of vertices. Generate our triangle solid walls. Whatever. I, my throat is really going to hell right now. But that's what we have. Let me show you one more thing. Uh, what I showed you right now is my uh, SSE optimized bloom thing, which is not actually finished yet. But I have an unoptimized version that has another other features that are enabled. But I gotta go to uh, I gotta go to branches, and I gotta switch to Starfield, which won't let me do it because I have to commit. So let me go home. Let's go to changes. And uh, I guess I I guess I should commit. Wanna switch, bitch? There we go. Now I can go home. I can go to my branch, and I can switch to Starfield. And if this doesn't fuck up, I can show you uh, pretty pretty stars. So here's the same thing, only without the optimization. And I've added stars, parallax scrolling stars to the system, which is kind of cool. More or less the same. I think I turned down the uh, blur factor on this one a little bit. But you get the idea. So yeah, that's just some stuff that, uh, stuff that we might get to, stuff that we will get to, stuff that we probably won't get to depending on factors. But for now, we have successfully conquered the world of collisions and we are ready to, uh, I don't know, do stuff. Do some more. Use it. Now I'm just, I'm just parroting phrases from two best friends. So I guess it's time for me to say goodbye. And I will see you guys in a week or so, or maybe a couple of weeks, depending on stuff. If you want to see me faster, click the like button, because that motivates me. Hint, hint. Anyways, later.